Hello and welcome to this uh, lecture of the course elements of mechanical vibrations. This particular lecture is essentially how the theory of vibrations as we learned through this course, how that can be used as an example in health monitoring of a typical mechanical equipment. So, the condition monitoring refers to monitoring the health status of various mechanical elements like bearings, gears, shafts and other elements which are critical to the operation of the machinery. So, we use mechanical vibration response in diagnosing whether the system is operating as per its design and is there any failure that is uh, about to happen. We talk about um, the last topic of this course that is condition monitoring. Uh, it is um, it's related uh, to vibration uh, theory as such, uh, although the, the, the whole field of condition monitoring is quite uh, wide and multidisciplinary. Uh, multi it's uh, it's not only related to vibration, so it encompasses many uh, fields of uh, engineering as such. Um, but here, I'm just going to give you a brief glimpse and correlate or relate it uh, with vibration theory. Uh, condition monitoring, also called as the health monitoring of uh, assets. Uh, either they can be assets or they can be uh, you know uh, machineries or structures, civil structures. Uh, they, their health is monitored or their condition is monitored by different methodologies and any deviation from a healthy condition is detected by processing various parameters or various signals and then used for ensuring that the condition is always healthy and the untimely failures are avoided. So, in the context of uh, mechanical vibrations, I am giving you an example of a grinding machine tool here, um, which is uh, you know creating um, finely polished or finely uh, machined surfaces on the workpiece uh, using a grinding wheel. Uh, and then if uh, the vibratory uh, motion of this grinding wheel um, you know increases uh, for variety of reasons, then the, the workpiece which is going to be machined is going to be uh, you know of, of uh, reduced quality. So, the quality of the machine parts are, are going to be influenced by deteriorating condition of this system which is actually a vibratory system. You can see that uh, this, this wheel is nothing but um, a disc and it is uh, supported in different bearings and this itself is now um, a vibratory, typical vibratory system. So, uh, if, if the health and or the condition of this vibratory system is not uh, kept uh, within the close tolerance values, then the quality product, quality of the product is going to be influenced, right. The other example is of uh, a defense equipment. Now, the defense equipment like what you see here has many uh, mechanical parts, there, is, there are engines, there are transmissions, um, there are gearboxes, pumps and so many uh, critical uh, uh, machinery uh, equipment inside, uh, which if they deteriorate in their quality of operation, then um, the reliability of the mission being undertaken is uh, will get compromised. So, from the, uh, the, the reliable operation uh, and the success of the mission, uh, these, vibra these vibratory system or these equipment acting like a vibratory system has to be kept in the, the, uh, the working condition or the most um, uh, effective operating condition. The third example that I am giving you is um, related to uh, you know aerospace industry where um, uh, this helicopter with uh, with gearbox as one of the critical element mechanical equipment uh, if if that gearbox which which is uh, you know part of a, a transmission system if that fails then um, there is a serious threat to the lives of the people so if if the condition of uh, of each of these equipments which are uh, more or less every time 
uh, are acting or are, are actually vibratory systems and their condition can be assessed using uh, vibration as a parameter um, is very important, very critical. So, this uh, is a domain within uh, the vibration engineering where uh, we may use uh, among other things vibration as a significant and important parameter for keeping the condition of these equipment uh, uh, up and running. So, uh, to the to the best of uh, the possibilities. Now, what are these condition monitoring parameters which we can use for um, ensuring the, the, the machinery or the equipment works uh, perfect? Uh, there are there are various parameters like an oral parameter for example in an automotive engine uh, if you take your vehicle to the garage uh, the mechanic will immediately start it and look for some audio symptom or the the parameters like uh, oral parameters where he will listen to the uh, to the sound coming from the engine to detect any anomaly in the system okay so sound as one parameter sometimes some equipment have um, possibility of detecting damages using some uh, simple visual observation like uh, using boroscopes in the uh, heat exchanger or furnaces where uh, visual observation is good enough to maintain the condition. The other is the temperature. So, if you take the bearings, the temperature of the bearings will tell you whether the condition is uh, appropriate or it is deteriorating. Uh, wear debris um, either from the bearing oil or from the gearbox oil if you drain out the oil and look for the particles um, uh, the debris particles which uh, can indicate whether the wear is abnormal uh, in in the in the gearbox uh, or in the bearings and that will tell us the uh, the health or the condition of the equipment in addition Yes, vibration is one of the most um, convenient and important uh, uh, diagnostic parameter where the health of the machinery is diagnosed based on the quality of vibration and we will discuss about this uh, parameter in more detail. But there are of course other parameters such as acoustic emission parameter or operational variables such as the pressure and then the uh, you know the temperature of the equipment, um, um, sometimes the speed for example, in power stations, the uh, the vacuum in the condenser uh, or the power being generated as the operational variables are, are used for tracking the condition of the equipment. Right? So, these are just the glimpse of all various parameters which can be made use of in monitoring the health of the equipment. Um, but vibration is the one which we are going to focus because um, there is no dispute about uh, vibration being the most convenient parameter to, to, to measure. Uh, it comes with a cost, but it is very effective that is the reason. Now, all these parameters have different advantages and uh, lacuna. So, this particular figure shows that if the equipment is behaving uh, well up to a certain uh, operation, after that because of a general wear and tear or because of the, the failure of some sub components, the, the, the condition starts deteriorating or degrading and you have this much period of time to ensure replacements or corrections, uh, otherwise there will be untimely failure of the equipment. Now, it is possible that by employing some of the parameters which we have seen in the previous slide, one can uh, you know keep track of this deterioration. Mm, so, among the total time or opportunity for the corrective action, if you rely on noise, it may be too late uh, to figure out the damage. The noise starts emanating generally a little later in the, in the progression of the damage uh, compared to other parameters such as visual inspection, temperature changes and um, maybe lubricant analysis for the wear debris particle or a lubricant quality. Uh, but it has been observed that vibration is a parameter that gives you early warning symptom of any change in the condition of the equipment long before temperature shows up or long before the noise starts uh, um, you know giving its indication. So, therefore, uh, in general it has been observed that this vibration as a parameter 
is an important one to con, con, you know track the condition of the equipment. Now let us focus um, on how this vibration is going to give me an idea about the degradation or a uh, you know deterioration of the condition or health of the equipment. So I am just taking a simple example of an electric motor. You know that uh, this electric motor is uh, having uh, you know rotor and then the rotor is supported on these two bearings and this rotor spins in the state uh, inside uh, a stator winding under the um, yeah and then these bearings basically support this spinning rotor. So as a as a vibratory system this rotor uh, can be treated like um, a, a, a spinning shaft um, supported on bearings and this we know that a simplified way to represent this is in the form of a vibratory system. So a shaft plus a rotor if the shaft is is is, is you know um, uh, big enough in terms of its diameter. Uh, and compared to its length can be treated like a rigid one without any deflection and the and the bearing stiffness can be treated as the the spring element in the vibratory system the damping in the bearings can be uh, can be uh, you know uh, simulated here or assumed here as the dash pot element for our typical single degree of freedom vibratory system the inherent unbalance in this uh, in this entire rotor uh, can be the excitation force to the vibratory system. So, the force acting on the rotor is going to be um, the rotating unbalance in the shaft. Of course, in addition to that there will be a magnetic pull which is uh, going to be generated because of the operation of it in the stator winding. But in, in general we can treat uh, the excitation force uh, coming from the rotating unbalance. Now, if this is your vibratory system which has certain stiffness, mass and damping properties, I can write then the governing equation of motion for this vibratory system as we have done many times now uh, max double dot plus c x dot plus k x equal to f of t. Now when things are going fine and if everything is working all right, uh, the system is in the best of its health and condition, this equation is the equation that describes the dynamics of this uh, particular system. Now, we would like to look at what will happen if the uh, condition deteriorates, but before we do that, we, we know that if this f of t is the, uh, is the, is the uh, excitation coming from the rotating unbalanced case, then the response is going to be uh, given something like this. You already know that um, the response to uh, a harmonic unbalanced excitation force is uh, a, a pure harmonic signal as, as this and the amplitude can be obtained from the parameters of the vibratory system as well as the excitation uh, system um, uh, properties like the unbalance. But this, this is going to look like a healthy condition vibration of the rotor which I can measure by recording the vibration of the shaft which is coming out from there. Uh, but let us look at this system little more closely and one of the most common element of this vibratory system which generates faults or deteriorates uh, its condition is the bearings. So, if you if I consider this uh, one of the two bearings here and see this bearing it is possible to sh uh, see that uh, this rotor is supported by the bearing which I am defining as uh, the, the spring which I have used here. Okay. Now this, this bearing itself is going to have a very little or a very minor fluctuation in its value based on the ball position. So if the balls are located uh, you know like this about the vertical gravity uh, line. Uh, then there will be some uh, stiffness uh, based on the ball positions right all, all along the circumference but if these if this ball comes to this central position and then the other balls are located like this the the stiffness of this bearing changes and in effect uh, in 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 short the stiffness of the bearing is going to fluctuate um, uh, based on the position of the orbiting balls and that small fluctuation 
in the bearing stiffness is going to create excitation to the uh, to the vibratory system and how is that ha going to happen because we all the time assume that the bearing stiffness is constant but i can use this uh, you know what is known as a varying compliance effect of the bearing that there is some mean stiffness value as you can see that there will be a some uh, mean stiffness value but there will be some very little perturbation or variation in the fluctuation in the stiffness value so there will be some delta k and some uh, it might fluctuate with certain frequency uh, omega f right and this is how instead of constant k i am going to have um, a varying stiffness and that equal to f of t so even if there was no excitation uh, except the gravity uh, there is the ex the governing equation of motion will have this additional excitation term which is going to create an excitation to the vibratory system and that's going to create uh, a slight amount of vibrations to the bearing now this fluctuating part is very little and so it's generally not going to uh, create major uh, condition deterioration um, particularly when the shafts are long enough and flexible anyway but that's not the point what basically is being seen here is that even for the healthy conditions uh, this particular parameter of the vibratory system would be uh, not a constant value but will be having a some fluctuating element that is going to create uh, certain kind of vibrations but in addition to that if the bearing a raceway generates a flaw or a defect on its raceway like what you are seeing here and that is going to create a problem for us how is that going to happen each ball will pass through that defect which can happen because of poor lubrication excessive loading and so any so many uh, conditions and parameters are re re responsible for that if that localized defect is generated because of its operation that localized defect will cause sudden excitation to the rolling ball uh, as the ball passes through that defect and that condition can be can be considered or can be assumed to be uh, you know like this where each crossing of the ball or each passage of the ball uh, through this localized defect is going to generate impulsive loading on this particular inner race of the bearing okay so as this ball hits here then the next ball will hit then the next ball will hit and this is how periodically you will have excitation force um, generated uh, on the inner race which actually means that the the force in this particular governing equation of motion is going to be modified because this f of t is not only going to be this but a sudden impulsive uh, you know excitation force because of the interaction of the rolling ball over the defect is going to create an impulsive loading on on the um, on the bearing inner race and in you know inner race is nothing but uh, fixed on the shafts the shaft is going to uh, vibrate because of such kind of a excitation so what is going to happen because of this the response is going to be impulsive for a short period of time when this particular impulse or this particular impulse acts so each of these impulses are corresponding to each of the passage of the ball through the localized defect and therefore uh, in general the response could have been a harmonic uh, you know uh, response because of the uh, rotational unbalance but now that gets modified in the form of an impulsive uh, high frequency uh, uh, vibration response right uh, and because the the geometry of the bearing is such that the the time gap between successive balls hitting this particular local defect is related to uh, the geometry of the bearing so this repetition period uh, after which these impulses are generated that can be obtained from the geometry of the bearing and it's called as the characteristic defect frequency so by looking at the time domain data from the measured uh, vibration signal one can uh, easily uh, identify whether the bearing is healthy or not healthy the point here is you still have the same basic vibratory system being modeled and some parameters of this vibratory system mostly the stiffness or the excitation function 
will get altered by the presence of many of the mechanical defects which typically appear. Okay? So, this is just one example of um, a, a rotor bearing system as a vibratory system and how um, you know condition deterioration in, when, in one of these elements of this vibratory system generates different kind of a vibratory response and by detecting the differences in the response uh, one can identify uh, if there is any fault and what type of a fault it is. The other example is that of a gearbox or a geared rotors. You know that um, the gears are, um, uh, are basically teethed elements uh, engaging with each other and transmitting the torque and power. Um, so, if you consider one such pair of uh, gear teeth, uh, they are uh, going to engage all along uh, from the tip of the gear tooth to the root of the gear tooth. And so, it so happens that uh, depending upon where the teeth are in, uh, in engagement, depending upon whether the, the engagement is taking place at the tip of the tooth or at the root of the tooth, the, the stiffness is going to be different. It is very simple because if you consider the tooth to be a cantilever, if you apply the force here, the corresponding displacement is going to be larger. But if you apply the same force, contact force here at the closer to the root of the tooth, the, the displacement is going to be uh, much uh, smaller as compared to when the force, the same force was acting here at the tip of the, the cantilever. So, it basically this force to deflection relationship generates the stiffness which is not going to be a constant value based on the engagement of the tooth at different locations all along the contact profile or that length on the flank, these effective stiffness of the tooth is going to be different in each uh, instant of time during the entire contact cycle. So, basically you may then consider this contact to be uh, you know in the form of a stiffness and damping. Uh, damping will come because of uh, there is always a sliding uh, action between the two teeth we already know from the kinematics uh, and that um, friction if the lubricant is not there there will be a coulomb friction uh, damping if the lubricant is there then there will be some viscous damping uh, due to um, you know the sliding motion uh, except at the pitch point. Now, so the point is because uh, the stiffness of the tooth is uh, different at different times uh, but still that stiffness can be modeled like uh, a gear mesh stiffness kg here and then I can uh, write the governing equation of motion of this particular uh, you know geared uh, rotor system. Now, the of course, this is going to be in, in, in theta terms, but I am just giving a representative equation and the, the most important part in this particular case is that the contact point since it is sliding from the tip to the root and back again. Uh, this stiffness is not going to be a constant stiffness which we typically use for our general linear vibratory system. Okay? The k is not going to be constant, it is going to be a function of theta or time and uh, quite similar to the bearing case that the stiffness was not constant. It can be shown, this is definitely not the, the point of discussion, but you can find out from literature that uh, during one contact segment that means, when one pair of teeth starts engagement and till the contact cycle completes, one uh, contact uh, you know cycle gets completed, uh, if, the, if the, uh, the contact ratio is more than 1, the stiffness of the gear teeth uh, that changes in this way, one cycle. Okay? So, stiffness when two, two, uh, one pair of teeth are in engagement this is the, con uh, the gear mesh stiffness. If two pairs of teeth are in engagement, this becomes the, the stiffness of the gear. Right? So, the point here is that k is not a constant value, but that k is going to be dependent on time or angle of rotation because at one point of time, the stiffness is so much, suddenly it drops and then it, it follows this cycle, which actually means that the stiffness is uh, a continuous function of time. Okay? And because of that, as we discussed in the previous uh, case as well, that this k uh, is not going to be, um, uh, you, you can treat this k to be a constant term mean value 
and some fluctuating component that is going to be kt which is going to be fluctuating component. So, if I keep the mx double dot plus cx dot plus this constant part on the left hand side, then the right hand side is going to be uh, you know uh, this kt into x which is basically arising out of the fluctuating or a varying comp a varying part of the parameter k and that is why this system is called as the parametrically excited system. This excitation function k, k t into x actually becomes now the excitation source. So, even if there is no unbalance, even if there is no other excit external excitation, the system will get excited and will generate vibratory response. Now, this is something which is happening even without any deterioration in the condition of the system. That means, when if the even if the gears are perfectly healthy, this kind of uh, excitation is going to be there. But if the gear uh, generates a flaw like what you see here, a spall on the flank, uh, there will be some distortion in the stiffness profile. So, the stiffness profile will slightly uh, change and that change uh, is going to get reflected in the changed vibration response which is what we are going to show you. So, one can again uh, use this particular gearbox as a vibratory system. So, I can and I can model the shaft, the disc, the, the gear, um, uh, one shaft and the second shaft as a simple vibratory model and the, the connection between these two uh, gears will be through a gear mesh stiffness which is k which I can uh, which I can simulate as a function of time based on this known uh, stiffness variation profile. And I can also take the bearing stiffnesses and damping into account and I can make a multi degree of freedom vibratory model from uh, this system and generate the response. If a gear having 27 teeth has a has a fatigue crack on one of the teeth, if suppose there is a crack in the teeth, then uh, then that crack can generate a, a dip in the stiffness value, overall mean stiffness value. That stiffness is going to reduce because the crack is going to make this tooth weaker. And so, if only even one teeth is uh, having a crack or any flaw, the, the mean stiffness level drops at that particular engagement cycle of the first teeth. Uh, and then the rest of the teeth are perfectly healthy and therefore, they generate the kind of stiffness variation that we discussed earlier. Now, if you use this, um, the, the, the time domain response of this uh, particular gear teeth, uh, a, a gear uh, uh, pair is, is shown here. So, what you see is that time versus amplitude response and you can notice that whenever such a defective tooth uh, comes into engagement, the, the vibration uh, at that particular point uh, gets changed from a normal healthy condition. So, these are the healthy uh, teeth vibration response and these are um, the defective teeth vibration response. So, uh, rest of the times the, the, the signal is more or less stable, but whenever such a defective tooth uh, engages, there is a localized change or a, or a um, transient uh, response change that is observed in the response uh, history. Now, if you take the um, Fourier spectrum of this particular time domain data, um, you get the frequency domain signal something like that. Now, you do not worry too much about uh, you know how to get that FFT, some of you might be already aware of how to get the frequency spectrum from the time domain data, but the point is these periodic um, perturbations or signal changes that happens because of the defective teeth. Uh, generates a peculiar vibration response pattern which is observed in this frequency spectrum. If the defect is not there in the teeth, then the general vibration signal would look like these frequencies only and ideally this is how the spectrum will look like. But because of the, uh, the defect in some of the teeth, uh, you can see that these kind of uh, sideband uh, vibration frequencies will appear which can be used for diagnosing the health of the gear. Now, the whole purpose of telling you all of this is not to teach you details of the health um, or the diagnostics or the dy dynamics of the gear rotor, but to show you a glimpse of how vibration as a signal feature 
can help you diagnose the deteriorating condition of a vibratory system like a gearbox. This in no way is, is going to demonstrate or uh, you know discuss in detail the dynamics of the vibratory system of a gearbox, but only to show you how vibration uh, which we learned through the theory elements uh, elementary theory of vibration is can be extended to study the dynamics of complex mechanical vibratory systems and uh, that can be used for diagnosing the health of the mechanical equipment. The other example that I would like to uh, you know finally uh, uh, give you is a fatigue crack. So, um, a fatigue uh, crack can uh, can appear uh, on the shaft like what you see here uh, due to a large uh, fluctuating stresses, um, bend bending stresses in the shafts um, uh, because of the um, uh, flexible shafts being used with uh, high speeds and uh, higher loads and under the uh, against the aggressive um, environment like high temperature uh, conditions and that creates uh, a fatigue crack. So, uh, this is a picture of the actual uh, fatigue crack that um, has been generated in a shaft. So, you can see a fractured surface uh, here and uh, this is the crack front and this is the um, uh, crack area right. So, <coughs> um, when such kind of a fatigue crack exists what actually happens is that at this particular cross section of the shaft um, only this area is bearing the load that means uh, this particular part of the total cross sectional area this area does not contribute to the to the stiffness or load bearing uh, part of the cross section right. So, only uh, this area of the cross section bears the load and therefore, the, the stiffness in this localized uh, uh, I mean cross section um, reduces significantly uh, and, and that creates a change in the stiffness value. So, here if you consider this to be a horizontal shaft under the gravity loading and this kind of a crag exists in the cross section as you can see exaggerated view of that crack which will open uh, the, uh, the, the two areas and will create an open area here which actually means that only this area of the shaft is bearing the load ok. So, the crack is wide open. Now, this crack if it is assumed to be on the underside um, because of the tensile of, uh, forces on the underside or on the lower side of the shaft they will open the crack here. But when this crack, uh, I mean, when this shaft rotates by 90 uh, by 180 degrees, the the same crack will go at the top. But because of the compressive loading on the top side of the shaft, when the crack goes at the top side, it will get closed because of the compressive loading that appears on the top side. Okay, so this is something which is shown uh, here. So. At, at theta equal to 180 degrees, um, this is theta equal to 180 degrees that is on the under uh, and on the lower side, this crack is going to be completely open ok. But the same crack or when the shaft rotates by 180 degrees, when it goes at the top side, the compressive uh, loading on the cross section will close the crack and the entire surface will bear the load. So, this is shown here uh, at, at at, at, at theta equal to 0 when the rotor is or the crack is on the top side here, uh, this cross section is completely closed, the crack closes, but here um, this is completely compressive region. So, the crack is half closed right and then it is half open here. This is at theta equal to 90 degrees if uh, you consider this to be 180 degrees and uh, so, the rotor is always rotating. Uh, in the in this direction and then uh, after every 90 degree of rotation the crack area will continuously open and close. So, at 180 degrees of uh, position where the crack is on the underside, underside meaning that it is here, um, the crack completely opens and now with the further rotation again half the crack which is going to be under the compressive region and this one is in the tensile region. Um, 
the half the part of the crack is going to be closed and then uh, here it is it is going to be completely closed now if you if you use this to show how the stiffness of the shaft changes as the crack changes its orientation as the shaft rotates you can say that at theta equal to 0 degree the crack is completely closed and it is like a, a uncracked rotor stiffness which means that the crack is almost the, the, the effect of the crack on the stiffness is not there at all ok. So, if the crack is half open and half closed the stiffness drops to a certain value and when it is completely open when the crack is completely open under the action of the tensile loading the stiffness drops to a significantly low level ok and as as it, it rotates further half open half closed it will have certain stiffness value and then again back to a completely closed condition the stiffness is again back to the same as the uncracked shaft. The point is had the rotor been without any crack it is an intact rotor the stiffness does not change at all ok. So, it remains constant irrespective of the rotational position of the shaft obviously you can uh, agree with that that if the shaft is uh, is uncracked it is going to have the same stiffness all through as it rotates. So, the stiffness does not change, but because of the crack being opening and closing uh, continuously and gradually uh, during a rotation the stiffness of the shaft uh, fluctuates like this, which again brings me back to our governing equation of motion we have always been solving this governing equation with m x double dot plus c x dot plus k x equal to f of t, but this is the case where a damage or a fault in the system in the form of a fatigue crack it is a fault it is a flaw that fatigue crack changes the parameter of the vibratory system in this case the stiffness. So, the stiffness is now going to be function of theta the angle turned by the rotor and therefore, it will generate excitation to the vibratory system exactly the way we have discussed in the previous couple of slides that a uh, parametrical variation or the variation in the parameter of the vibratory system as a function of time is going to create additional excitation to the system and that is going to create um, a specific response feature. So, for example, if I if I con had considered a cracked sorry uh, an uncracked shaft uh, a rotor without a crack the response under the action of unbalanced excitation force is going to be harmonic ok. But this kind of a stiffness variation which you see here if I use this in the equation of motion here then I will get a response which is going to be seen that way ok. So, I am showing you the response of a, a typical response of a cracked rotor right. So, this is the, the response as a function of time. So, instead of a harmonic signal you will see a periodic signal being generated and that is all because of the varying stiffness value which is shown by this particular variation. And if I take the spectrum of this or a frequency decomposition of this you can see that there are multiple frequencies that appear. Uh, harmonics of the rotational uh, frequency in the spectrum and had it been an uncracked shaft a, a benign uh, a healthy shaft it would only show under the action of unbalance only the first harmonic or the rotational frequency in the response or the spectrum. Whereas, these additional frequencies uh, uh, you know uh, presence of these additional frequencies theoretically can indicate the presence of a fatigue crack in the rotor. Now, again this is all to show you how every mechanical vibratory system is defined or characterized by a governing equation and and majority of the mechanical faults somehow either modify the forcing function or the parameters of the vibratory system like stiffness or damping. But 90 plus percent of the times it is the stiffness which gets modified and that modified stiffness generates a slightly different kind of a response vibratory response. And when you compare the original healthy condition response with the 
uh, changed vibration response then the difference basically will tell you what could be the reason uh, the first thing is it establishes that there is a deterioration in the condition of the equipment and then by analyzing that signal uh, through variety of means uh, one can uh, identify the possible fault in the system right but most of the mechanical systems uh, when they are um, when they undergo some deterioration in their condition uh, they will uh, uh, you know they will give rise to a, a specific uh, vibratory response which is characterized by certain um, parameters and using those parameters one can diagnose the condition of the equipment right? but the, at the heart of it it again is the basic vibration theory at work so just to wrap up this part there are of course n number of different kinds of faults in mechanical vibratory system we simply cannot give get into the details of each one of them and this part this particular uh, you know topic has been just taken to to, to highlight uh, as one possible application area of vibration theory so if there is an increased unbalance we know that the first harmonic or the rotational frequency related response increases uh, if you have misalignment you know higher harmonics will appear because of the misalignment in the shaft uh, in the coupled shafts uh, if there is a bearing wear the response again would change by in the form of a changed orbit plot um, rolling element bearing we have already discussed we have discussed how the gear tooth damage will cause uh, a, a different kind of a vibration response and if there is uh, the rotor when it is rotating and if it is surrounded by a stator if it hits and you know strikes the uh, stationary rotor there is going to be a peculiar vibration pattern which will get generated and all of these are going to generate specific vibration symptoms which uh, if properly analyzed can um, definitely point to a certain uh, flaw which is uh, why this particular field is exciting and extremely uh, dynamic it is multidisciplinary and lot of research is still going on in um, increasing the robustness of the diagnostics okay of the condition finally i would end with um, one of the uh, example of how uh, uh, you know uh, industry uh, on on the shop floor can uh, can can use the severity chart for assessing the preliminary uh, condition of the, the the mechanical equipment so what you see here are uh, is a gearbox from where uh, sensors can be placed at an appropriate location and that sensor can generate a vibration signal that sensor uh, vibratory signal let's say x or x double dot is uh, is plotted against time here this is a typical vibration response signal which i can get from a gearbox and i can uh, I can get an RMS value of this gear vibration signal. Uh, the the theoretical expression for the root mean square value obtained from uh, a time domain data is shown here. Of course, this is um, uh, this shows that x as a continuous function of time, but you can use a discrete uh, ex, you know discrete values of x at every sample value, and then uh, instead of integration, you can sum all these values and find out the RMS value of that. Uh, you know digitized signal but you can also find out this rms using this expression uh, once the root mean square value of the vibration signal recorded on the on the equipment is obtained then uh, using the iso standard one can categorize uh, the equipment whether it is uh, operating with healthy condition or not okay so depending upon what is the capacity of the equipment um you know the, the capacity of the machine uh, there are prescribed values of the vibration velocity rms value of the vibration velocity so for example if if we are taking the vibrations on a 15 kilowatt machine um, uh, and and the vibration rms value turns out to be one one millimeter per second rms which means that i am and that if the foundation is rigid uh, I am basically located here because one millimeter per second uh, RMS vibration velocity um, uh, means that 
the condition is uh, is is almost like a new new machine and the, the machine is perfectly healthy and I do not need to worry about it. Um, but if it reaches to maybe uh, more than 2.5 millimeter per second uh, RMS value velocity value, then um, there could be a little bit of a concern that it is going into um, a region where it is not uh, absolutely healthy um, and uh, I need to take care of it if it continues to uh, grow from that point onwards then some corrective action has to be taken uh, and of course if the vibration velocity value goes beyond 7 or so which actually means that um, I am getting into a dangerous kind of operating condition. So, this uh, is in nutshell as a broad uh, guideline chart um, that you can find out whether your um, machine condition is, is, is healthy or not based on the measured vibration uh, value and using that vibration value I can I can find out uh, from this chart whether the, the system is in a healthy condition or not. Okay. So, this is in general um, uh, the, the way uh, the vibration based condition monitoring used to have um, been carried out in, in the industry. Okay. But of course, the now people have migrated to uh, more sophisticated approaches and um, much more involved diagnostics uh, is carried out instead of only based on the RMS value, but this is uh, the basic of the vibration based condition monitoring. So, the summary of this lecture, we discussed how various physical parameters are possible to monitor the health of machines and of these various parameters, the vibration has been considered to be one of the most promising parameter to monitor the health and we deliberated as to how different machine elements such as bearings, shafts and gears, they produce vibrations which are very peculiar to the defect that they have. And so, the vibration response change can be directly correlated to a fault brewing up in the system. And that is uh, what we discuss the, the faults as a source of change in vibration and uh, a careful uh, deciphering of the changes in the vibration signature uh, can uh, act as a diagnostic approach. The review questions based on today's lecture. these are the answers. So, here we are at the concluding part of this course uh, elements of mechanical vibrations. During last 12 weeks or so, we had uh, a sufficient uh, in depth understanding of the fundamentals of vibration and uh, what we are going to do here is to take a very brief recap of all what we learned in this course. So, we started first with a simple single degree of freedom system model of a given vibratory system. So, we limited ourselves to uh, just a single degree of freedom for a given physical system. We explored as to how the governing equations of motion is obtained, how the natural frequency is calculated and in addition to that, we also understood how the response to initial conditions is obtained and in that context we uh, you know considered a couple of uh, interesting examples to drive home the point and once the basics of the single degree of freedom system in case of uh, undamped free vibration has been explored we then uh, looked at how the damping plays its part in attenuating the vibration amplitude over a period of time so in that context we considered a couple of practical damping sources for example, a viscous dash pot which is typically used in automotive systems and in a steam turbine case, a uh, case of a coulomb damping how it plays its part in attenuating the vibration response. Once uh, different uh, damping models were uh, considered, we then shifted our attention to response to arbitrary excitation wherein we understood how a short duration arbitrary or transient excitation can be accounted for in finding out the subsequent vibratory response. So, in most of the times we considered this vehicle 
as one of our physical vibratory system and then simplified it as per our convenience either as a single or a multi degree of freedom system. So, after having uh, discussed the free vibration response both in the case of no damping or with a viscous damping case, we then shifted our attention to the case of forced vibration and in that we investigated the harmonic excitation as the primary source of excitation for a practical vibratory system. We uh, extended this understanding to investigate how the response to periodic excitation can be obtained and then we also explored the concept of transmissibility both displacement and force transmissibility and understood the relevance of tuning various parameters so as to derive uh, the best uh, transmissibility condition indicating that the transmitted force or the transmitted displacement to the target is minimized. So, having explored the single degree of freedom system and its response character for variety of operating excitation sources, we then shifted our attention to a two degree of freedom system and in this context we found how the same vibratory system now if we want to capture some of the dynamics that we miss out while considering only a single degree of freedom system can be obtained and therefore a suitable governing equations of motion for a two degree of freedom system were formulated the concept of mode shapes was introduced and this was followed by the concept of vibration absorbers and in that case we took couple of practical examples of how these vibration absorbers are used in practice either in the civil structure or in the mechanical automotive systems. So, having considered a two degree of freedom system, the concept of mode shapes and other aspects of two degree of freedom system, we started exploring how a multi degree of freedom system can be modeled as a set of governing equations of motion which are typically coupled we understood how a system with many degrees of freedom can be modeled as a vibratory system. In that context, we also explored how the numerical methods can help us uh, model the similar systems with much more accuracy as compared to a lump parameter model. So, in this case, uh, an example of a, a Holzer's method or a Michelstadt problem method of finding out the natural frequencies and mode shapes of a typical complex uh, structure was discussed. So, in an example of um, a music box cantilever beam, it is almost indispensable for us to use uh, numerical methods rather than lumping the parameters. Then this was followed by uh, continuous systems, wherein we considered the entire system or a continua as distributed parameter system wherein the mass and stiffness properties were a continuous function of the special variable. And in this case, we considered the example of stretch strings, uh, vibrations of a bar and that of the beam. And essentially then uh, understood how the differential equations of motion for such continuous systems are characteristically different compared to the lump parameter model. And the last topic was condition monitoring wherein we have discussed how the presence of typical mechanical faults in a vibratory system changes the vibration behavior and the response character of uh, the vibratory system and based on the differences in the healthy condition and in the defective condition the change in the vibration behavior can be uh, related to the type of fault and the severity of the fault. So, essentially a vibration as a phenomena has been discussed um, in its elemental level and in a short course of uh, just 12 weeks it is difficult to do justice uh, for all the aspects of the vibration phenomena. However, fundamental theory of vibration has been presented and I hope by following these lectures you will be in much better position to understand some of the main and important concept of this wonderful field. And I must thank you all for joining this course and I look forward to interacting with you in future again.